Good evening, everyone. Um, it's with great honor um, that I introduce everybody to tonight's um, Zoom event for the Iranian American Society of New York. I am um, a big fan of Mrs. Ali Khani. Um, I have enjoyed her company. I've met with her in her wonderful restaurant, um, uh, Sofre. Um, it's it's one of the finest foods I've ever eaten and enjoyed. And it, you, I really always leave there with a huge smile on my face. I honestly never thought food can do that. I'm, I'm not a glutton. I don't eat a lot. But when I am at her restaurant, it is it, it is it is it is it makes me happy when I leave. So I want to, first of all, encourage everyone to to enjoy her wonderful culinary cuisine. And I know how much attention and detail and love she gives in her in her work and art. Um, as the president of Iranian American Society of New York, I would love to introduce um, uh, one of my favorite board of directors, Mrs. Heidi Donishvat, uh, who will introduce Ms. Ali Khani um, in much more greater detail than I can. But I just want to let everyone know. I, you know, please make sure you 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 give it, give a chance. Um, and they're very busy, so you got to give enough time to get in there. But you should definitely um, try to make a reservation and and experience it for yourself. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mrs. Heidi Darnishvar, who will now introduce uh, Mrs. Ali Khani, um, owner and chef at Sofre. And Erbal, the rest there. Okay. That's fine, my time is on his track. Merci, Ali John. Uh, uh, I'm so pleased to be with you tonight and to have the chance to introduce our guest speaker and a very good friend of mine, Nassim Ali Khani. Nassim was born in Esfahan and a graduate of Tehran University. She moved to America in 1983. Her dream was to become a judge. Uh, back in Iran, Nassim grew up learning to cook from the women in her family, most notably her mother, her aunts, and her grandmother. Food was always a way of life for her but it was unthinkable to pursue cooking as a career in Iran. So instead she studied law. But when revolution struck and the school was closed, she had, to be, she had to reorient herself and figure out a new dream. In her early twenties, she moved from Iran to United States. She came here as a student to go to law school and quickly realized that law school was not her passion. It took Nassim 25 years to realize her, her dream of opening a restaurant. In that time, she worked in various professions unrelated to food. A foundation in Iran and Greece ran marathons, took up hiking and mountain climbing, ran a coffee shop, fed homeless, did charity work, including assistant relief earthquake in the city of Iran, Ban. Cook for her kids' school events and found herself coming up with new opportunity to host different occasions. But most importantly, she raised her beautiful twins. Her dream of opening her new, her own Persian restaurant in New York was postponed several times. And her dream was deferred until 2011, when she realized her joy of feeding a soccer or basketball team was coming to an end 
as her kids were finishing up schools. She then laid out her business plan to her husband, the Wall Street investor. Although she heard time and again how risky the restaurant business was, she persisted. And we are glad that she did. <laughs> For six years, this <clears throat> driven mom of two interned at various restaurants and even did a six months program in French culinary school. Finally, in 2018, at 59, this former stay-at-home mom built one of the New York hottest restaurants in Brooklyn, New York, called Sofre. Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the woman behind Sofre, New York's most exciting Persian restaurant. Nassim Ali Khani. My pleasure. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm truly honored to be here, especially in the company of Haide, as some of you may know, as the most amazingly beautiful and calm and sweet and a host, but I also know her since day one that I arrived in this country. And I think she offered me my very first job in this country. So it's such an honor for me to be here. Um, we, can, we can go and talk a little bit more about what Sofre is today, what quickly, I just maybe wanna share with you all about uh, the pandemic, which is still happening and continuing, but really impacted the restaurant industry as a whole, a lot of industries, but particularly restaurant industry. And um, there were, when we just announced the shutdown, the lockdown news back in last April, I just truly thought, God, I just started my dream and now it came to a halt. But that was very short-sighted because I quickly rebounded and my husband, who has been always and always and always my biggest support, he said, we have nothing to be afraid of. If there is one restaurant standing in New York City, it would be us because we have nothing to lose. We raised our kids. We have our pension plan in place. We have our house. We will continue. And that really brought so much assurance to me. And a year later, we have a successful business. I kept my staff in-house. I kept everyone on payroll. And uh, as soon as we were allowed to open, we did. And I don't think we have even been stronger than before. I'm more confident, more tired. I am working 14 hours a day now, but sorry about my voice, because as you may all know, that there is a tremendous shortage in the industry, uh, in our industry right now. I don't know the reason, but you can't find cooks, you can't find dishwasher, you cannot find servers. So I play all the roles. If you come to Sofre, I may boss your table, I may take your order, or I may just sit and chat with you, or you may not see me, but I, I love what I do every day. And um, it's truly an honor to be my age as a, as a woman, as a immigrant woman and someone at my age, which is still not very young, but not old, but I'm still quite vibrant and, and active. And just, it's, I don't know how to explain to you. I, oh, so many times I was ready to give up on this dream. So many, so many times. And I'm glad I didn't, not for the name of Sofre or the food that I'm passionate about or the country that I'm so devoted for my own sanity and for my own self. Um, I am like a kid in a playground every day. So I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. I think I just said enough and all your kind words, you were all, both of you very grateful to give such an amazing <laughs> introduction for me. I'm at, at your service. Let me know what would you like to know.
Uh, Tusa, can you uh, unmute Mr. Nurchash? That's fine, my name is Nurchash. Good evening, everybody. Hi. I admire Ms. Uh, Matrani. Cooking is an art uh, in my mind, and uh, I appreciate it very much. One question I had is that uh, uh, are you planning to expand in the sense of having branches elsewhere? And the reason why I'm asking this is that New Jersey lacks Persian mm -hmm. restaurant of Homedale, Middletown, and Red Bank, where there is a large community of Iranians in the high-tech companies that are, uh, I would personally appreciate it very much if there is a Persian restaurant on the, the uh, in, uh, in Red Bank, which is a relatively metropolitan uh, area of the New Jersey. Um, unfortunately, I don't personally have any plan of expansion. This is as is. I work six days a week from 9 a.m. and often to 9 p.m. And uh, opening another or expanding another location requires, requires either I clone myself or I find somebody who can deliver what I deliver every day. I still cook the dishes myself. I have a team, but um, I supervise absolutely every aspect of the restaurant. It's madness, but I wouldn't do it otherwise. Uh, by opening another location, I would, uh, I don't even open for lunch. Many people are asking why not lunch because I cannot sacrifice the quality of the dinner for the sake of having lunch because it will affect the service. It will affect my, uh, my attention to every detail. And um, I also, the reason I went to Brooklyn, many people say, why not Manhattan? I live in Manhattan. I know Manhattan very well. Manhattan is a center of food for the entire East Coast. I want it to be a corner place that I can do uh, what I'm passionate about in a quiet and relaxed way. Manhattan would not give me that, that opportunity. I had to be fast paced. And many people asking for California, why not the largest Iranian community? I, again, first of all, I don't have the manpower to do this. And maybe later on, I have a very extremely talented chef who is helping me. He is young and he, he knows how to replicate stuff. I am not him. And if he wants to take that further, he will have my support and blessing because uh, he is almost as capable as I am in, in terms of the food profile and what he can deliver. Plus he has the industry experience that I don't have and I don't claim to have. And to be honest, I don't care. I'll do what I do. I say what I say and often wrongs and I rob off people on the wrong side, but people accept, you know, one thing about having few, few gray silver hair is just, you can run your mouth and you can do things on your way. To answer your question, unfortunately, I don't have that plan, but, but we are opening my young talented chef. As I mentioned, his name is Ali Sabur. He grew up here. He is opening with my support. I am his investor at another restaurant uh, in Bushwick, Brooklyn, in an artsy neighborhood of Brooklyn. It's called Aval. And um, uh, as soon as COVID situation resolves a little bit, uh, he will open his own restaurant, which is a sister restaurant of Sofre. And let's see what happens. I mean, I really, I didn't open a restaurant to, um, become famous or make money. I just did it for my own heart. I needed to do this for 25 years. Anybody who knows me, they heard me saying, one day I'm gonna have a restaurant. And this, this became like a broken sound that it would never ever happen, 25 years. Eventually it did happen. My sole purpose was introducing our amazing culinary tradition to the world because I traveled a lot. I have eaten all over the world. I have been to amazing fine dinings. And I always just thought, why nobody does our food? We have such an incredible food culture. Why? 
And eventually I set out to do this in the best of my ability. I'm not saying I'm doing like an exquisite job, but I'm doing my best every single day. And um, my second purpose after Sofre got the track that I never believed, like New York Times write about Sofre or, or they do a profile and all the interviews, I still cannot wrap my head around it. But that gives me another opportunity that by opening Sofre, by doing what I'm doing, other young professionals who dream, who have such dreams like me, get the courage and they say, well, she did it at her age with no background, with uh, zero background in, in the industry. But I work hard. I don't want the young people think that, oh, gee, you just dream and then tomorrow will happen. I, I paid my dues. Uh, I worked six years for free in various restaurants for free every day. And if they are willing to do that, somebody like me already paved the way. We don't have to have just kebabi and cello kebab and cello kebab. Enough of that. We have plenty of good kebabs. We all know it's great, delicious. I love my sultani, but enough. Now it's time to enter culinary scene. And I'm hoping, not me, somebody else in New Jersey or Long Island or all over or in Atlanta, God knows what, they have a dream, they have a passion and they have and ideas, and they take this incredible culinary tradition and make it their own. I'm hoping that we already see this. I, I see a, a lot of press coverage in London. There are restaurants who are doing similar things as, as I am, as Sofre is doing, and that just brings joy to me. I'm, it's already in such a short time, we have reached a milestone that we didn't have before, a fine dining place that is not pretentious or obnoxious, or it's not cliche, it's modern, it's New York, and people come and um, they ask all kinds of questions like, this is not Irani, or this is not this, or this is not that, and yet it is. When they put the food in their mouth, it reminds them of the cooking they know, their wife, grandmother, someone, and, and I'm hoping that that becomes a pathway for future generations, for younger people. And I hope like in, ten, in my lifetime, I see Iranian, amazing Iranian restaurant in every city of America. That's I'm hoping for. But uh, I, I thank you very much uh, for doing this because Persian uh, uh, food culture is, is quite deep, is as deep as the, our music, uh, other uh, artistic forms. Uh, uh, I hope uh, I, I wanted to know where the address is in New York one. And also I hope that you uh, uh, create someone like yourself for New Jersey. Hmm. Oh, thank you. The, our, the Sofre restaurant is our, we are in Brooklyn. If you just put Sofre NYC, our name comes up. Our address is 75 San Marks Avenue, but the best way is uh, first of all, come with reservation. Please make reservations because many are Iranians, uh, even my friends, they are not used to make reservations. And when they make reservation, they think our tables are expandable. No, they are not. If you make reservation for four, please show up with four. Don't come with sticks and get disappointed. Why? We are not, a, we are a real like restaurant. We can't just expand the table. We have limited seating, especially post COVID. Um, and some Iranians, I heard, I overheard the other night as I was passing one table, I overheard somebody because we have a lot of rules. Like, for example, we only give one caddy per table, not because I want to be obnoxious about it, because simply we only make certain amounts and we put the count on the computer and we give one caddy per table. And we don't, we make our kebab medium rare. And I believe the meat I use is such a fine quality that it has to be eaten medium rare. Iranians like their meat well done. Sorry, take something else. So as I was passing by a table, I overheard an Iranian guest of ours saying, <laughs> we, we are not obnoxious and we don't have attitude. We just operate like a restaurant, not a kebab house. But, and I love my kebab but we are operating with a small staff. So please come join us and um, but look at our website, make a reservation <laughs> and we would love to have you as our guest. I am impressed, good luck. Thank you. Mr. Nurbach, Nurchash, Babashid. 
I, I am a victim of everything Mrs. Adekhani just said. <laughs> But I have to tell you, I asked my friend to leave because we had a reservation for six one time and he was the seventh. But you you have to follow her rules because her rules is what makes her food so delicious. And like I said, I, I don't eat much food for people that know me. But when I eat there, I, I order everything that I'm allowed to because there are rules on the tally and what else you can order. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, so let me tell you something. Unless you experience it, you you won't know. But but please do because it's worth every second. And the experience is part of it. You know what I mean? Something it's actually because I'm younger um, Iranian, obviously. Um, it's teaching the older generation not to follow, you know, the way that they think that, you know, you go to a restaurant. Mrs. Ayakhani is absolutely correct. Any other restaurant you go to, you make a reservation for six. You don't have any expectation that you can go out to more people, except for if you're going to a cabinet, right? So she's absolutely correct. Why should her restaurant be any different? But again, it's worth the travels from New Jersey. Um, I can assure you, but make sure you have your reservations. I've been trying to get in there the last month and they're fully booked. So it's also, you know, you have my emails. Don't have, you don't have excuse. You have my email now. Oh no. <laughs> I, can I tell you something? Ms. Khan, I don't use your email to ask you because I know you're very busy. I use the same channels as everyone else because I don't want to break your rules. So I appreciate it. But so now you're telling me I can email you. Thank you so you much. You can, if you, especially if yeah. you have a party, you can. At least once, try me. I forward your email to our manager. I, I, and we really would love to. But when we see an Iranian name requesting, I don't want to sound like ir- we are obviously we are far away from our community and 80, 90 percent of our guests are non-Iranian. So when I see Iranian faces come to the door and when I see Iranian name making reservation, it's music to my heart. And we make a little extra effort to fit in our people because after all, we are Iranian restaurant. And especially I know people are far. They come from Long Island, Connecticut, New Jersey. Los Angeles, we need to accommodate them and we will to the best of our ability, so. Uh, I'm also hoping in, and you can publish a book uh, that uh, extends your tradition to the next generation. There is the book in the works. I am writing currently a book, and but it's a long process. Uh, it should be released in about a year. That's great. That's great. Mrs. Goli? Hello. Uh, hello. <laughs> I, I was going to, I'm not Goldie's husband. So, and I, I'm American. And I think my question was just answered, but maybe I'll ask in a different way. Um, I was curious because I, as an American married to a Persian woman, I was introduced to Persian food as an adult late in life. And I loved it like a lot of other people. So I was curious uh, what percentage, and I think you answered it, of your customers are American, non-Persian, and um, I think you said 80, 90, and if they have uh, eaten Persian food before, if you've, you've been the one to introduce Persian food to them. Um, it's uh, a majority of our guests are non-Iranians, and that doesn't mean they're all American. Uh, lately we have, I see a lot of Indian and Pakistani and a lot of Lebanese, some Israelis. It's the beauty, of, the beauty of New York in general, and especially Brooklyn, it's just so mixed and people are open. Um, I, I try any kind of food from any nationality. Actually, I'll go and search for that because New York is the place. So people come very open arm and many of them, many of them tell them because I'm on the floor. Usually, uh, if I'm not exhausted, I walk around the floor and engage with my guests. Many of them, they, it's their first time, majority of them. But lately, many of them already come and they come like a couple and then they love it so much. I quickly see the reservation in a week or two or they, I recognize their faces and they bring their friends. So it's been, um, it's been an amazing journey for me because some dishes like um, Orme Sabzi or Ashreshte, they are complex flavors. They are rich dishes. And I am shocked when I go to a non-Iranian table and I see two people are having Ormusabzi. 
I asked them if they know what they were getting, if, if they had tried it, they had no idea. They said, no, we didn't. What made you order? Like your service said it's delicious. And what do you think? They say, it's amazing. So it's, uh, it's been an education for me too. It's been uh, really wonderful to be part of this whole uh, journey. That's great. Thanks. Thank you. Mrs. Danishma. So we all know that Nassim's restaurant, obviously the food is delicious. But one of the other things that I think is amazing and a lot of people when they go to her restaurant is the interior design that uh, you have. And I wanted to get some information from you. Who designer? Did you have input in designing the restaurant? And also tell us, is maybe it sounds funny, about the two famous bathrooms that you have in your <laughs> 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 That's, yeah. Um, that, we were waiting for the construction six years. It took us, uh, the, the building that Sofre is located, it's, it's our own building. My husband acquired the building about eight years ago. And the whole construction, and my brother lives on top and my sister uh, lives in the middle, which is my best friend, and we have the restaurant. This whole process took six years between the construction and planning and the building is landmark. Once you have six years sitting, working on your dream, you spend hours and hours and or at least I spend it, hours and hours thousands of hours in the internet, Pinterest, architectural site. I was just trying to envision the space Sofre wanted, was going to be. I knew one thing, Sofre to me was not going to be a traditional Iranian space, simply because that's my taste level. I, even my house is quite modern, very simple white and everything is a stainless steel. But secondly, I wanted Sofra to stand out. I wanted it to be a place that nobody can look at it and assume something about it, good or bad, it doesn't matter. To me, I want it to be non-descriptive. And I want it to be a space that when people walk in, they may think that they are in vacation, some sort, some place, Mediterranean, Turkey, maybe south of Iran. And I, because I had that general idea, I kept working on it. But what really helped my husband is extremely hands-on and those of you who have been to Sofre from the table surfaces to the bathrooms my husband worked on them we had construction crews and we had an architect but my husband and I we were so hands-on on every light fixture every detail but having all of that was not would not make Sofre what it is if we didn't have our uh, creative director, who is my dear friend. Her name is Rogia Topnock. She is a creative director and she has worked extensively for many, many hotels and restaurants and all my wacky and crazy ideas, she was able to just put it and make it wholesome and make it well-rounded. The, the two bathrooms, um, the idea came from me, but the execution came from Rogia and the logistics came from me. I wanted the Iranian cinema and music to be represented somehow. And um, I went five trips to Iran, not for that only, but in every trip, I tried to get my hands on uh, Persian uh, movies, posters. And eventually I was able to hit the jackpot and I brought as much as visuals I could. And one of them became our, one of our bathroom, and then some of these movies became the other bathroom. Bathrooms are a very important place. I want, um, in every restaurant I go, before I personally, before I sit down to eat, I go to wash my hands, but I mostly go to check their bathroom. If they have given enough attention, in my opinion, to their bathroom, and the bathroom is a spotless, I'll be less judgmental and less critical. I let them, you know, I'm very picky about the bathrooms. It's such an important place. It's a place of reflection. It's a place of joy, especially in a restaurant. Who wants to go to a boring bathroom? Bathroom should be a place that um, after especially you want to wash your hands, this is like welcoming you. Or if after your meal, you want to just 
check your makeup and see, it should be a place that you want to go back again, another place to just go and do your thing and leave. So I hope I accomplished that in our bathrooms. <laughs> yeah, definitely. We see a lot of selfies. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of selfies, I know. Let me just add, Mrs. Alifani, just so uh, as a customer, by the way, though there are rules and, you know, everyone wants to think that, you know, you made a comment that someone made a comment to you at your restaurant. Uh, but that's how you want to run your restaurant. And I really appreciate that and your strong character, uh, because at the end of the day, you are you are wonderful and, and the nicest person. You actually go to every table. I've also witnessed that aspect of you taking care of your restaurant like a baby with your brother who also goes to every table but wants to make sure everybody is happy and they got everything they need. So, you know, there's two sides, you know, I don't necessarily think having rules makes you just want to make sure your restaurant is run a certain way. So the, the, I, I've experienced the, the greatness as, as well, you know, but, but my point is it's a very friendly environment and it's a lovely environment and they're playing black and white sixties films in the bathroom. And that was, that was just one of the most, that, that was a, that was a very welcoming experience because I actually used to watch those movies as a child. So it was wonderful <laughs> as well. So any other questions? Hi, can you hear me? Hi. Hi, Nassim. Nice to meet you. Merci. Nice to meet you too. Um, I live on 500 St. Mark's, so I live like two blocks away from your restaurant. I walk by it all the time. I love it in Brooklyn. Uh, and I just, I noticed your menu is obviously not a standard Khoresh menu or a standard kebab menu. So how did you pick your menu? Can you talk us through how you picked your menu and how you combine certain dishes together? Sure. Um, some of the items in my menu, they have been in a stable in my house for years like the kufta berenji, the little meatballs. I cooked it at least once a month uh, for my, or the chicken palm sauce was the most requested uh, chicken dish when my son's friends had a sleepover. So many of these dishes came from me or smoked eggplant that Mirza Ghasemi from north of Iran is the dish that I crave for. So to begin with, I do not cook or think of anything I don't like myself. I'm from Isfahan, and Isfahan is famous for a couple of things. One is Beruni, one is Khoresh Mas, which is the, it's a very strange thing, is a, is a lamb neck yogurt stew kind of a thing, which is sweet. And Isfahanis are known for it. They take pride in it. To, to even think of it, does not make me happy, let alone making it. And everybody who is from Esfahan, they come like, when are you going to make Polish masa? Never, because I do not like that dish. So every dishes that you see, uh, and we change our menu uh, periodically, not full menu, but few items in the menu. Um, they basically have been thought over the years very, very carefully. Um, I, but I wanted to... Uh, a restaurant to be representative of the variety of our culture from north to south uh, and in between, like at Sahan. And we have such a, a wide ways, wide flavor profile in our food. So I just thought very carefully, I want people to see a sour stew or a sweet and a meat dish and a lamb shank. And I just thought about, and then I changed like, about a month ago, two months ago, we had Fesen Jun. I won't let Fesen Jun to be permanent in the menu because I simply believe Fesen Jun and dishes like Fesen Jun, they should be happy. They should be having a time frame. They should be missed. They should be treasured. And, and so I, I think about all these variations, but to answer you briefly, when I started the menu, I already had the menu because I have been cooking for large parties, churches, events, catering events. Uh, I volunteered massive parties. And during these years, everything I put, I watched my guests, how they eat, what they tell each other. People didn't know I was the one uh, cooking the dish. So I was going around mingling with my guests in large parties. 
and basically make a note of uh, people's reaction. And that became my starting menu. But uh, you can't have the same menu. I get bored and then I hired a, and I'm working with a very talented chef that we started thinking, okay, do we just want to do strictly traditional dishes or do we want to add a little bit of creativity? So now we do, we have few dishes on the appetizers that they are not typical Iranian dishes, like you don't see them in, in any homes because they are our creation, but they have a strong foundation in our culture. Once you, it looks different, it has no name that Iranians can relate to, but once they taste it, it's familiar. So it's, a, it's an ongoing process. Every season I, um, I think about what vegetable or what is in the market, right? Right now we have asparagus appetizer, which we didn't have, it's asparagus season now. So um, that will be taken a month from now and maybe I will bring sour cherry rice, al -balu -balu. I'll just don't know. I mean, every month I think about what I wanna add, but there are some foundational dishes that I will leave in the menu. Did I answer your question? I just tend to go on and on and on. I pleasure. Of course. First. One more question. <laughs> علی خانی متاسفانه من نیستم but your educational background is law funny yeah. that I have a, I have a presently working in my house who is a Cornell law graduate but he's doing now work the kind of things that uh, uh, other other skills well, yeah, I would have been a terrible judge or a lawyer. I don't have, I, I don't have capacity for uh, going through papers. I need to move. And it was when you're young, you have some ideas. I'm so glad that the whole revolution thing made me realize that I was in the wrong place. And I just, I'm glad that I eventually it took me 30 years to find my place, but I'm glad. Eventually, I did. That's great. I'm glad as well. The world needs less lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyone else have a question? Raise your hand or... Oh, Mrs. Danishva, my family. Sorry, uh, Mandaram Nassim John, uh, about your recipes. Uh, I know, obviously, you're from Isfahan, and some of your uh, dishes are from that region. But I notice also there are some dishes from south of Iran, um, or from north of Iran. Um, how do you come by deciding what dishes to put on your menu based on the region of Iran? Does the, knowing someone from that region uh, sort of motivate you or just randomly you decide? No, there is no, first of all, I only, as I think I said that before, I only cook something I love. If I don't like something, it won't, I won't even cook it for the house, let alone for the restaurant and feeding people and charging people on top of it. So I love every one of these dishes that I have on the menu. But um, the dishes from the South, I had no idea. Esfahan is desert and people in desert, of it, they don't, uh, now they do. But when I was growing up, there was no fish culture in Esfahan. We only had like some river fish and they were smelling and my mother was like, this is disgusting. But then when war happened and we had an influx of uh, refugees coming from South uh, to Esfahan, many of them, we were fortunate enough to have neighbors, two or three neighbors that my mother became friends with and they were incredible uh, cooks. And they introduced me to, first of all, the spices that 
they cook their food as spicy. And I suddenly realized, gee, I love so much the heat element. Our food is so bland, like no pepper, just a little bit turmeric. But then the people from South, they, their food has a kick. And um, I was a teenager in college and I just loved it. And then I was introduced with qalia mahi, which is a fish stew, and then shrimp dishes or balmier stew from the South. And I was just like, wow, this is incredible. Uh, same thing with North. Um, my, we were traveling for vacation to North of Iran and I just couldn't have enough of the dishes that we were only getting lucky or if we were traveling to Shomal once a year. So when I, um, when I started really cooking, um, I was often making here Mirza Ghasemi or other dishes, but I only chose to put the dishes from both regions, North and South, when I was able to find people from that region that I loved their cooking and I knew they are masters in their own cities. I cooked my version and I had them test it and tell me this is a good one before putting it in the menu because I think it's just so wrong for me to come and claim a treasure Qaliya Mahi dish from South if it's not, not, not done right or Mirza Ghasemi from North if it's just hush posh and, and messy. So I made sure that I get this stamp of approval before putting it in the menu. And I did, I did put my work through this. Yeah, that uh, um, the mahi that you make is delicious, obviously. I tasted that. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. Actually, that Galia mahi made Sofre to suddenly explode because um, Melissa Clark happened to be living in that neighborhood. And she came one time and tried the fish. She made the reservation two days later and a week later, she asked me to give the recipe to New York Times. That exposure after a month we opened allowed Sofre to just like boom, explode it. And but the recipe is out there. If you Google Sofre, Qalia Mahi fish sauce, recipe is out there. You can, uh, you can. Another thing, another thing uh, Mrs. Adekhani also they paid attention to every aspect of the restaurant, but I've noticed that your drinks are are unique as well. Oh yeah, they're, that they're is... all they're all create. I mean, who created the drinks or the drink menu? Because first of all, they all have some Farsi name um, to keep the you know culture. But who came up with that, Mrs. Alekhani? I, I never knew. It was uh, it it came kind of haphazardly. Uh, it started as we needed a drink menu. And uh, we obviously had wine and beer. And to be honest with you, I, I, I don't think wine is an amazing complement to Iranian food. Um, some wine would work, but overall, I think that's why in Iran they do just vodka because that's a much better straight up, straight up vodka because our food is so strong. You don't want to mix it with the acid of wine. So when we were talking about having a the drink menu from very early on. I had always at home simple sharbats, like second jibin I make at home for my guests, or sour cherry albalu, sharbat albalu, or a few other sharbats. I was making sharbats always. And I, at home, I was mixing them like second jibin with gin or albalu with, uh, sour, with uh, vodka or tequila with Limu Ammani, and I was just like, why not take that idea? And But you can't just suddenly say, oh, gee, I have some sharbat and some liquor. Let's just come up with it. Yes, you can for your own party. But for a restaurant to be successful, I basically wrote my sharbats. I knew I want to use saffron. I knew I want to use pickle. I have four amazing sharbats. That was my first cocktail menu. And I had a very capable bartender. I sat with him. We tasted the, the syrups and we said, okay, we need a gin drink and a tequila drink and a whatever, vodka drink. Let's, let's start pairing this. And lots of trying different, different spirits to come up with what works with what. But I was 100% to this day, I make all the syrups. I come up with the... Um, 
concept. And my daughter, all those beautiful names that you see, they are hush posh. They are like a combination. There's a one word Farsi and one word English. Yeah. For example, the latest one is Rivas Sour. So Rivas is rhubarb and sour is a sour drink. So we make a sour cocktail with the Rivas name. So my daughter writes the, the name and she just combines them. And it's a lot of collaboration of a lot of people. Um, um, our creative director came up with the look. It's important, the visual, so people look at it and it's an attractive cocktail menu. All the cocktails are different. Um, all the cocktails are prepared in a small batch, the syrups. And uh, it, it just suits our culture very well because we have an amazing drink culture. But minus the alcohol part, we have damnush, we have all kinds of tea, we have all kinds of sharbats. It's no brainer to add different spirits to it. And I can't wait for the day that Iran becomes like normal. And then you see what is going to come out of the country because the, the foundation is there. The culture of drinking is there. You just have to add the alcohol. And I think it's very natural. Uh, at least it came very natural for me. And um, but it, it took work still every season, every couple of months, I definitely add one cocktail and I take another one out. Um, so summer is coming. I'm going to add a couple of new cocktails. So come back. We will be some new cocktails on the menu. If everyone thought you gave a lot of attention, you pay a lot of attention to the detail of the drinks, they should really try the food because that just, that's just, you know, a, a pinpoint of how much detail you also give your food because again, it's exceptional. It, it feels like it's homemade, you know what I mean? And, and, and really made with love. Any further questions? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, who is that? Just want to make sure. Dave. All right, go ahead. Um, I actually had read about uh, your restaurant and then I uh, reserved in March of 2020. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Lock. And, uh, it's funny because uh, when I told, I think my sister who lives in another town, I said, I have reserved. Um, she said to me, oh, you know, it's pandemic. I said, you should see how I can't get a reservation because it's so bad. I already got. But then, but then you closed. I just wanted to know from that time, did you close until when? And now do you, you don't have outdoors, right? Yeah, we do have outdoors. We actually, that's how we managed to survive the pandemic. We have, we always had a front outdoor. We always have a front of the place uh, for sitting outdoor. And then we also have a deck in the back of the restaurant. And that allowed us to survive the, the tough time of the pandemics when we couldn't see people inside. Oh, so you never completely closed? Uh, no, we did. We, we had to close. We closed down for New York was in lockdown for four months. So we did close, uh, but we closed a few days before the, the governor's order came because I knew that we had to close. The, it was just a matter of time. So I prepared my house, my team. Uh, we had a meeting and we prepared for closing. And we did announce it to our customers. Also, we canceled many. We had a big Noruz event planned. We canceled that. It was just before Noruz. On March 16 of last year, we closed. And the Noruz was going to be, I think, March 21st. So we did plan. We organized. And then a day or two later, the shutdown order came from governor. And we just complied the order. We completely shut down. And we reopened uh, when the order of opening uh, with limited outdoor only came in, I believe it was June, end of June of uh, 2020, yes. We did open, but with limited seating until just recently. Right now we are at almost full capacity. Well, that's good, nice to hear that. Yep. Any further questions? Except um, from uh, Mr. Nushash. I'm just. I have a question. Let's have it. All right, just just do it, Anna. Me do them. Come on, as Saul Hay and Pish, but Ari Mani do it. Steam. Because they're having. As you can make one, but let's back. Let's have it. Next question. I have question. 
Oh, be fine, my friend, Ms. Ziba. Hi, how are you? Thank you. Sorry, sorry about the late. Uh, I have a question about the R spice, especially spice zaffron. You know, I have a friend, uh, a couple friends. They are they are not Iranian. When I have uh, when I invite them, them when I cook uh, and use the zaffron and zeresh, they don't like it. Sometimes, some people, especially the children, because the taste is so different for them. Uh, my question is, what happened in your restaurant? Do you, ha do, you, do you have any experience that people complain about the taste of the zaffron or zeresh, especially, you know, American people or European? I am surprised about zeresh. They, mm -hmm. um, they love zeresh, mm -hmm. uh, even the children. I have had small babies on a high chair that I go back in the kitchen and they consider it like maybe because it's New York and the children in New York are exposed to all kinds of food and they have their parents try everything. Um, they love Zeresh. They cannot have enough of Zeresh. Uh, it's important how you treat your Zeresh, mm -hmm. how you glaze it, how much sugar you put, you don't want it. It's a fine line and Zeresh is a very delicate berry so we treat it with respect it deserves and everyone adores the Zeresh and many people are asking me what it is and we have actually one Zeresh uh, drink uh, which is one of the most popular cocktail. I, I believe is Zeresh and rum. Obe Zeresh and uh, rum is just very, very successful. As far as the Zafran, uh, Zafran, again, Zafran, once you treat Zafran, Lightly as a flavor enhancer, just a little broth on top of something. They like it. Everyone likes it. They don't even know that it's there. But if they know it's there, yes, it's very strong. It hits them on the face. So what I'll do with my, um, that's a trick I learned from a grandmother in, uh, not my grandmother, one grandmother years ago. I was a teenager in Esfahan that she was diluting her saffron very light color. Iranians like to put saffron, and in my opinion, often they want to be generous for their guests, but in my opinion, they overdo it. They put too much. I'm not saying you're doing it too much, like that. I don't even know how much you put, but my experience has been like too much saffron. It takes away from, in my opinion, the whole food. Saffron should be treated with just a touch. And I mix uh, my saffron water for the rice with a little bit of rose water. So when I dilute my saffron, I always add a touch, even at sofre, when you eat sofre's rice, there's a hint of rose water. And this way they get the saffron, but they also, it's perfumey with saffron, with rose water. But again, too much rose water turns them off. Too much of anything turns off people. So yeah, no, I don't have actually, I treated with, plus for restaurants, saffron is very, very expensive. So I treat it with care. Where I put it, how much I put it, what I mix it with. And I never had, occasionally I had, we have a Zafron cocktail that it's a strong for some people and our servers are trained right now. They make sure that people know what they are getting. And occasionally we get a Zafron cocktail returned, which is fine. We, we replace it with whatever our guests would like. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, I have one more question. I don't know how to raise my hand on this. Um, Is this Faye? Yeah. How Go ahead. My hand. Um, so, um, yeah, I, my other question was that if I want to come there, how do I uh, reserve for outdoors? Like, does the site uh, allow you? You just go to Resi, and Resi gives you an option of outdoor and indoor. Okay. Uh, usually, outdoors are booked way in advance. Uh, most people want to come on weekends. We are booked at least six weeks ahead of time. So reserve early and uh, be flexible. And maybe if you cannot get a table Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, come Tuesday and Wednesday. But when you go to Resi, um, which is a site for reservation, uh, it allows you to reserve outdoor or indoor. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. I'm going to ask you, oh, um, I don't have your name, sir, but go ahead. It says MRC, so unmute. Hold on. 
Go ahead, Atusa. Thank you. This is Masood. Uh, if uh, you may, how do you make up the rush? We have enough the rush at home, but I just wondered how do I make up the rush? You soak it overnight and you just pray it in a professional blender and you pass it through a fine CF and you get up the rush. And, okay. you keep, and you can keep the remaining pulps. I put it in my meatballs and as a flavor enhancer, it still is lovely. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to ask the final question unless there is more questions. Um, so I know, Mrs. Adekhani, you, so you spoke of your book. Is, is this, this a biography or is this uh, uh, is it going to be an element of cooking, like a cookbook? So, oh, it's a cookbook. It's oh, a it's cookbook. a cookbook. It is a cookbook, ah. but with a lot of personal stories. Uh, I'm very lucky. Uh, Kanaf uh, Publishing House is the publisher, which uh, is such an honor. I never thought they would approach me and let alone accept my story. So it is a cookbook yeah. with a yeah. lot of family stories okay. and a lot of my growing up stories, uh, what I knew of old Iran. This is my wife. You've met her before. Hi. Hi, good to see you. Tell them how much you love Mrs. Adekhani's food. It's so fresh. Oh my God, it's the best. It's the only <laughs> reason why I come to Brooklyn is for you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm flattered. Thank you so much. Honestly, Iranian food has always, uh, you know, growing up in America and trying to explain to people. Uh, wh what where Iran is, what Iran is. You know, I came here in 1987. I always got to connect with people through food. Um, unfortunately, it was always with kebab and, you know, the general restaurants that we've, you know, learned to love. But, you know, now I'm trying to get people, non-Iranians even, to come share your wonderful food and, and you know, the, the recipes and just so they could just they could feel it. It's, it's very hard to get reservations. So... <laughs> But but I think I think I'm going to take your advice. Stick to Tuesdays and Wednesdays, possibly, uh, because I think and Sundays I and Sundays. Sundays also. It's I love Sundays at Sofre because it's mostly local neighbors. It's just very laid back and relaxed. I love it. I always stay on Sundays. And Sunday, it's till, it's till ten. Nine, I believe. I honestly don't know. I don't run the place, but uh, at night. But I think the last reservation is at 9.30, I believe, or maybe 9.15, the last sitting, the last reservation. That, but that means that the restaurant is open until they feed the guests. But yes, last reservation is 9.15. And what is your largest reservation? I know you have the room downstairs. Uh, is that more than, uh, is there a limit to that? We can, mm, we can sit up to 20 people and... Um, People have had big parties, up to 20, and very before pandemic, a group of very cool Iranian kids, young kids, but, but young kids from uh, Long Island, they came with their music and they had a blast. We had a blast. Our guests from upstairs were coming and looking downstairs, what is going on? It was just fun. They ate and they danced and they drank and it was just fun. We haven't had large parties, larger than 10 because of pandemic, but now we can, we can see people up to 20. Okay, thank you so much. Um, My Mr. pleasure. Anishad, do you have anything further? Um, well, first of all, I want to thank Nassim for joining yes. us tonight. Um, one thing that I would like to mention that even I know your restaurant was closed during the lockdown, but I know that you fed several hospitals. You cook almost every week for different hospitals and you brought food to nurses and doctors. And I want to thank you for that. My wow. pleasure. That's, yeah, that was, that was amazing for me because I wanted, I wanted to become a part of a neighbor, a family. Like I wanted to become part of Brooklyn. And I thought I was until pandemic hit. And I was just, how are you become part of a community if you don't contribute to the community? And then when pandemic happened, it was just a no brainer. And uh, we have such an amazing group of doctors and nurses that they keep coming and I don't know them. And they come to me and they say, thank you. You fed us. We were looking forward to your food. It's just 
makes me happy, so happy. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Adekhani, from all of us at IAS. Um, I know that you've also helped our youth chapter in the past. I think that was actually during the pandemic, if I'm not mistaken, um, or it was actually right before. It was last summer. But thank you for all your efforts and for taking the time to come and talk to the community. I think that's a big part of who you are and how dedicated you are to the Iranian culture and the food. Um, I just want to let everyone know that we are going to have a live event for IAS in, um, in August 14th. So look out um, with emails and on our website. And also our last and final Zoom event uh, will be on June 13th, 2021. It's Sunday, June 13th at 8 p.m. I know it's Father's Day, but we have a very special uh, lady, Mrs. Atefe Riazi, who is... Uh, currently um, the interim chief digital officer at Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, talking to us about information technology. Um, and uh, I just wanna make sure everyone knows of these events. We do it for everyone uh, to enjoy. If anyone has any uh, suggestions or ideas that we can do things better, we would love to hear from you. You could always email us at info at IASnewyork.org. Once again, thank you so much, Mrs. Adekhani. For, for being with us. And I know Mondays are your nights off as an owner, um, but, but thank you for spending your night off with us. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm, I'm honored. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I hope I see you all soon. Thank Good you. night. Thank you so Bye. much. My pleasure. Good night.